Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, my name is Frank Romano. I'm the team leader of the Interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team. And it is my pleasure to give you an update on our research and monitoring activities this year and provide some perspectives on where we are with population status. Uh, hopefully answer some of the questions that several of you had um, yesterday in the process. I'd like to acknowledge, of course, the, the member agencies and all the personnel that participate as part of the Interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team, um, the federal, state, and tribal partners. Um, as most of you know, um, this has been a, a long-term collaborative, a very effective group of folks that work together very well, and uh, I think we've, we've been able to accomplish a lot in four decades. Quick overview of what I plan to present this morning. First of all, we'll talk a little bit about population estimation and trend. We'll cover kind of the initial topics that basically cover the recovery criteria. So we'll talk about grizzly bear mortalities. We'll talk about occupancy of bear management units uh, by females with offspring. We'll cover the details of our known fate monitoring. And as a study team, we also do a lot of food monitoring every year. We'll give you an overview of that and then we'll kind of summarize things. It's important to know that these are all prelim mostly preliminary results. Some of these numbers might change a little bit for 2015. We're still in the, the data gathering phase. Um, there might be additional data points coming in. So please understand that these are not final and these are considered preliminary results. Brief overview so of the of the ecosystem and some boundaries. I think it's really important um, when we start talking about population estimates and where we count mortalities, for example. So I just put uh, the national park boundaries on here as, as kind of a, a general reference. Um, represents actually a little bit less than 20% of occupied range at this point. So you see the, the core of the ecosystem, of course, is, is represented by Yellowstone National Park and, of course, uh, closer to here, Grand Teton. The recovery zone established in the, in the early 80s is that, uh, that blue line, about a little over almost 24,000 square kilometers. And then an important boundary is the demographic monitoring area. That area is about 50,000 square kilometers, and that is that this greenish polygon here that, that you see. Um, goes well beyond the boundaries of the recovery zone. And is essentially based on suitable habitat, defined, as defined by Fish and Wildlife Service. Critical to know what's currently, what is occupied range, and uh, this is using some of the techniques that uh, Dan Bjornley with Wyoming Game and Fish developed a number of years ago, and we're starting to use that now, um, essentially on an ongoing basis to update uh, occupied range estimates. And you can see that from this polygon that um, boundaries are well beyond the recovery zone, um, they're even beyond the demographic monitoring area in some areas, especially on the, on the eastern portion of the ecosystem. Occupied range, 58,000 square kilometers. More than double from where we were in the 70s when, when the range really was more restricted to the recovery zone. So, population uh, estimation and trend estimation. One important segment of the population for the purpose of population estimation is the known is females with cubs of the year. And in the past we might have used a, an acronym FCOI. Uh, here I'm trying to avoid that as much as I can. Um, so when I say females with cubs, I mean females with animals on their side that are less than one year old. So we're not talking about females with yearlings, we're not talking about females with two year olds, 
we're talking about females with cubs, less than one cubs of the year on their side. And this portion covers the, the child two estimate, which has been our in our ongoing estimator. That's that's the estimate that we've used for a long time. And we start off counting females with cubs of the year within the ecosystem and then apply what, uh, what we call the, a rule set to identify unique family groups, unique females with cubs, based on a rule set that was developed by, by Dick Knight. And we've referred to that as the Knight et al. rule. So that's, that's a start. Um, because citability might vary among individuals, we apply what we call a Chow 2 estimator. It's a statistical technique that basically allows you to estimate um, not only the ones you've observed, but also estimate the ones that you haven't observed. That's the whole point. So it, it, it estimates an additional number of individuals uh, based on a statistical technique. And then we look at trend over time using those numbers. First of all, um, where we start gathering this information is the several sources. There's ground observations, but we also get quite a bit of information from our observation flights. We have 54 aerial observation areas that you, uh, you see the boundaries of here on, on the map. We flew 51 of those. In, uh, we have two rounds of observation flights that we've um, consistently conducted since 1997. We flew 51 units in, uh, in round one and 43 units in, uh, in round two. Uh, there's still three units that we're, we're not flying simply because there's this, at this point no reason to, to spend effort there because there, there's no evidence of females with cubs there yet. Total of 189 survey hours. Um, the, the red squares that you see on the map are the 351 groups of bears that we observed from these flights involved, uh, involving a total of 501 grizzly bears. We had 43 observations of females with cubs, 33, and 36 observations with, of females with, uh, with older young, so either one-year-olds or two-year-olds. I show this slide because it has been suggested in the past that our population estimates are going up simply because we are doing more surveys, spending more survey hours. That is not true. Um, first of all, if you look at the recovery zone where the area that we're monitoring has stayed constant, we're actually pretty level. There's no trend in, in the number of survey hours. If anything, we're, we're actually a little bit lower than where we were a couple of decades ago. The increase that you see here, based on all survey units, is simply a reflection of expanding range of this population. As the population expanded into new areas, and we got sightings of females with cubs in new areas, we started monitoring those areas with our flights. So obviously, that takes more flight hours to cover those areas. Sightings of females with cubs in, in 2015, um, we had about equal uh, percentage-wise in, in terms of observations from the air or ground observations, and so these are the, the green squares are all those observations. Those are not necessarily unique individuals. That is the, the next step. So we apply that rule set that Dick Knight developed with his co-authors back in, uh, in the 90s. And based on that, we identified 46 unique females with cubs. Mean litter size that we observed was um, almost two. Nothing unusual going on there. That's pretty much been pretty steady. Uh, that's not accounting for some mortality that might have occurred after females with cubs leave the den and until our first observation. So there may be some cub mortality. So the actual litter size coming out of the den is higher than what this number says. In terms of the distribution among single, twins, and triplets, um, nothing unusual there, mostly, mostly twins, um, but solid evidence of, of good reproduction. It's really important to, to note that out of those 46, two females with cubs were completely outside the demographic monitoring area. So those females do not enter into our population estimates anymore. Um, we're not monitoring 
areas outside the demographic monitoring area. So we can't provide population estimates for those areas. So the population estimates are restricted to, um, to the demographic monitoring area. There's a couple of individuals that are also sometimes inside the demographic monitoring area, sometimes outside. Those are counted as in. So what you see here, are the, the different colors are of these symbols are um, individual unique females with cubs. The two that are completely outside, I'm looking at an angle here, but one is here and one is there. Now the suggestion has been made in the past that we're losing bears out of the core of the ecosystem. Um, you know, with all the with a lot of conflicts on, on the periphery of the ecosystem. Some people have argued that you see this uh, donut, people have referred to it as the donut hole effect. Um, there's no evidence of that if you look at these four maps, obviously. Um, so we have four decades of data, incredible data set. These are all locations of unique females with cubs over those four decades. And what you see, of course, is in the 70s and early 80s, primarily restricted to the core of the ecosystem, Yellowstone National Park, all primarily within the recovery zone. You start seeing expansion. You also start seeing the core area filling up more with additional animals. And if you look at the, the last decade here, you know, you, there's a lot of individuals in the core. There's also a lot here on the, the southeastern and eastern portion of the ecosystem. So if anyone sees a donut hole effect in you, let me know. Along the same lines, what we've seen over time is when we count, when we look at the count of initial sightings of females with cubs in relation to the recovery zone, we see this pattern of increasingly greater number. So these bluish blocks on top observations outside the recovery zone, you see a greater number of those over time. And we start seeing the same pattern here with the demographic monitoring area. Um, smaller numbers at this point, much more, much larger areas, so, but we are seeing more and more outside the demographic monitoring area. So the number of females with cubs within the demographic monitoring area, unique females with cubs is 44. Then we applied a child 2 estimator. And because we had a lot of uh, sightings, multiple sightings of, of individual females with cubs, unique females with cubs, that multiplier was, or that, that those additional number of animals added as part of the child 2 estimator wasn't that large, just a couple of individuals. So the child 2 estimate is actually 46. And then we apply um, a trend estimator because any population estimate will vary over time. And we want to smooth that trend over time so that managers can make better decisions. Uh, you don't want to make annual decisions based on an estimate that, that naturally varies simply because of sampling variance. So we, we've always used what we call a, a model average child 2. And that's essentially applying both a linear and a quadratic model to the time trend. And what the quadratic model does is it allows detection of a change. And it could be positive, it could be a negative change. And that system has actually worked very well because a couple of years ago we detected um, a slowing of population growth that we'll get into here a little bit later. So this is that, um, that model average trend line. So this is the variation that I'm talking about. You, know, you see quite a bit of variation of these estimators. And this, this would be true for just about any, any population uh, estimation technique. You see quite a bit of variation over time. And for us, um, what we do with this model averaging is to, to, to take that variation out and smooth that trend so that you have a better sense of you know, what is really happening in the long term. And so what we're seeing here is you know, we know uh, from other analysis, from population projections based on known fate data, we've seen uh, 4 to 7 percent population growth uh, up to about the early 2000s, and then we started, we started seeing that slowing down a little bit uh, between 0 and 2 percent. And this, these data basically um, support that notion. Then we use the model average estimate of the number of females with cubs of the year 
to estimate the total population size. We know from our known fate monitoring what the vital rates of this population are, survival, fecundity, uh, and so on. And so we know what portion of the total population this segment of females with cubs represents. And we apply those vital rates um, from the time period of 2002 to 2011 to that estimate to generate a total population estimate. If you do that, we get, because we have an equal, equal sex ratio, we get an equal number of independent females and independent males. And when I say independent, I mean those that are two years or older. So we have 246 independent females, 246 independent males, and uh, 222 dependent offspring from those calculations, resulting in a total population estimate of, of 714 as compared to 757 uh, last year. You see the confidence intervals um, spans about 150 animals, seven, about 75 on either side of the, the point estimate of, of 714. Now sometimes you know, these confidence intervals are misinterpreted. That is, the central tendency of the data will still be around the 714. It could be as much as 793, or it could be, based on this estimator, as little as 638. But the likelihood is that it's actually closer to that number. I want to revisit this, this trend slide. Because there was some mention yesterday that, that, the, that the population in 2000 was exactly the same as it is now. And that is actually not true. So now we have 714 individuals. But we've had a little bit of growth. And because the population level is relatively high compared to where it was in the early 80s, even the 2 1 to 2 percent growth is still adding a reasonable number of individuals. So if you look at 2001, we had a population estimate based on model average CHOW2 of 514, uh, 34 individuals. So we're 180 animals higher now based on this estimator than, than where we were in 2001. So this population is not totally flat. I think it's important that, that everyone understands that. There is a little bit of growth within the demographic monitoring area. There's also additional animal, animals outside the demographic monitoring area, of course, that, that, are not, that, that we're not really counting in this. We've pointed this out to the committee uh, before, and that is that we know that the CHOW2 estimator is a conservative estimator. That was helpful, at, especially during the recovery phase of, of this population. Um, you want, as managers, most managers want to be relatively conservative for a species and for a population like this. But we know there is an, an underestimation uh, bias in the CHOW2 estimator. And I'll, based on an analysis that Chuck Swartz uh, did back in, in 2008, uh, it demonstrated that very clearly. If you, he did some, um, using that, that rule set developed by Dick Knight, um, this, in this publication by Swartz et al., they looked at, okay, if you, have, if you know, based on simulations, if you know what the true number of animals in the population is, and you apply that rule set in the CHOW2 estimator, you want it to be on this 45 degree line. You want, if you have 40 here, you want to have 40 there in your estimate, obviously. Well, what's, what ends up being the case, from these simulations, it's clear that there is an underestimation bias. What is really important is that that, that bias um, increases over time. So this bias is much greater here than it was in the early days. That's because the more animals you try to fit into this system and, and using that rule set that is primarily based on distance criteria, it becomes more and more difficult to separate out unique individuals. So if you look at, at where we are right now with an estimate of, of roughly 60 um, females with, with cubs of the year, we would underestimate actually probably by about 40% according to these calculations. So that was the reason that a number of years ago, we investigated other techniques that would give us a less 
biased and relatively unbiased estimate of the population. That, what, that is what precipitated our investigations into a new technique that ended up, we, we looked at all kinds of um, possibilities and, and opportunities to, to develop a new technique. This was the one that looked most promising. It was a mark, what we call a mark reside technique. The basis behind it is to use those observation flights, two observation flights per year, and because we have a, a relatively good sample of, of females, radio colored females out there, with, we wanted to look at the, the marking aspect of it would actually be the telemetry portion. So uh, if, you, if our pilots see a female with curves, we ask them to use their telemetry gear to find out if it was actually a marked individual, radio marked individual or not. So that gives us our marked sample. If you look at that, uh, that sample compared to the total number of, of females with curves that you observe, you can use some pretty complex techniques to actually estimate how many females with curves are out in the population. That was all done as part of, um, of, of several workshops that we held with um, experts from all over the country actually uh, to develop that technique. We reported all that in the demographic workshop report in 2012 and we reported that to the committee of course. Um, it looked uh, like a very promising technique because it did provide us with a, a relatively unbiased estimate um, that, that corrected that, that underestimation bias from the Chow 2 estimator. And this was published in, in the Statistical Journal. The, the only issue with this technique was that there was a relatively high variance, high uncertainty around each estimate. And that is because we're dealing with relatively small sample sizes of, uh, first of all, females with curves to begin with, but marked and radio marked females with curves. So we have been investigating this and have been reporting, as, as most of you recall, to the committee for a number of years now, our investigations into how do we deal with this uncertainty, um, how, you know, what kind of, uh, what power do we have to detect trends? What is our ability to detect trends over time that would be, uh, you know, within reasonable, um, just, within reasonable uh, numbers to, to for managers to make decisions? Uh, can we detect a trend of a 10% change over 10 years, for example, or 5% over five years, whatever it might be? So those investigations are still ongoing. Um, our preliminary findings are that the power for this technique is relatively low. And so unless we have the ability to improve sample size, uh, which we're still looking at, um, there, we, we, we don't really know how well this would work as a technique for monitoring population trend over time. So, um, again, we, we continue our investigations on this. We're not reporting an actual estimate here because this is still ongoing work. Um, and we, in fact, we might abandon this in the future and we might pursue other techniques in the future. One thing that did become clear from looking at both the CHOW2 estimator and the Mark Reside estimator is that, as I indicated previously, that we have seen a slowing of population growth. And we just, uh, this past week, uh, we just published a, a paper that dealt with the potential causes behind that, the proximate and ultimate causes for slowing of population growth. And so we looked at, at the factors related to changes in food resources. Uh, everyone knows, of course, that there were concerns about whitebark pine decline, um, but there are also potential effects from increasing bear density. How, does, how could that have affected the population? I'm not going to go through that through all those results again because I did that at the, at the last uh, at the spring meeting. But I will summarize it here because um, and then I encourage you to, to look at that uh, paper and, and read it. Um, so again, the premise was you know what's what are the, the potential causes behind the slowing of population growth since the early 2000s, and when we contrasted the effects of food declines, white buck pine versus bear density effects. It, uh, it really started showing that, that bear density started playing a role here. Um, the proximate cause for this, the, the slowing of population growth, is really lower survival of younger age classes, cubs and yearlings. Based on correlations and based on our analysis that we report in this paper, uh, we see a strong correlation with bear density. So in areas where bear densities are greater, we see a greater effect on 
curve survival, lower curve survival in areas with higher bear density. So potential drivers for that may be interspecific killing, that's been documented in a number of other studies. It uh, could also be increased uh, interference competition uh, simply because of, of higher densities. We have probably more evidence of interspecific killing than, than competition. We don't see a lot of changes in, in body condition, for example, um, which would lead us to believe that um, there's less evidence of, of interference competition, but more evidence of, of younger animals being more likely killed by possibly uh, you know, older males, especially in areas with higher densities. So this, what we're seeing is this, this what we call a density dependent effect, indicating that this population, especially in the core, is reaching kind of a carrying capacity. And this, what we're seeing is effect of, of lower survival of younger age classes is very typical of a pattern that, that's been documented in other large vertebrate populations. And so it, it fits very well with established ecological principles uh, from people like uh, Lee Eberhardt, for example. That puts us into the next section, I'm talking about more documenting mortalities. Um, this is actually a um, mortality of, a, I think it was bear 767 in Yellowstone National Park, killed by another bear. This was actually in 2014. Total known and probable mortalities um, within the entire area is 1552, um, of which uh, 50, 47 were human caused, several natural mortalities, and a couple were undetermined causes. Um, so those are all. The, uh, shown here in the map, the ones that are circled are outside the DMA. And 10 of those are outside. Uh, for quick learners here, you can see there's only nine circles there because two mortalities are right on top of each other, so you don't see an extra circle. Summarizing these across uh, both areas inside and outside the DMA by, by female and male segment and different age classes, we can kind of concentrate on, on some of these summary numbers. Um, we see a, a, a total of 42 mortalities inside the DMA, 10 outside. Uh, in terms of those outside, it's mostly males. Um, we had uh, 13 mortalities of dependent young, 29 of uh, independent age animals, uh, and again, most of those are, are males. It's really interesting to look at the trend of cumulative mortalities over time. So if we just summarize it on a kind of a weekly basis, um, we've, we've put a number of years on here where we've kept track of, track of this. And we see a pretty typical pattern. Early in the season, uh, you kind of just gradually increase, and then when you reach that, that period of, of hyperphagia, where bears are really starting to, to bulk up for in preparation for uh, hibernation, uh, you see that, that some th things change, but there's also kind of a, a, a bimodal pattern. In some years, like the last two years, we, we don't see much of a jump during this phase of, of hyperphagia. Um, it kind of just keeps creeping along, and you end up with a, relatively, a year of relatively low mortality. But a year like this, we see this, uh, that, that's the red line here. Um, we're in another mode where we, we have relatively a higher number of, of mortalities, uh, with the jump primarily occurring during this time period. So when we look at the actual mortality rates, um, we start off with, with these different population segments. So independent age females, we have 246. Uh, we've documented eight mortalities. And we also estimate the number of unreported mortalities. So we get an estimate of total mortality to then estimate the, the mortality rate. So um, there were six, we estimated six unreported mortalities, so that makes for a total of 14 at a mortality rate of 5.7%. Now the sustainable mortality for independent age females, those that are two years old, uh, right now is 7.6%. So this number for the demographic monitoring area is below that sustainable mortality. For males, um, again, we go through these numbers, uh, 28 total mortality out of 246, that's a rate of 11.4%. For males, we had a sustainable mortality level of 15%. We're still below that. And for dependent young, we have, we have a, we don't, estimate unreported, 
um, but we are below the sustainable mortality for dependent young, which is also just like independent females, is 7.6%. Uh, in terms of the causes uh, behind mortalities, and, and these are of reported mortalities, of course, um, and kind of comparing it to last year when we, we had a year of lower mortality, um, we have a, a high number of, of livestock uh, related incidents. And, uh, and also a lot of uh, side conflicts, and especially the side conflicts tend to be indicative of, of years where um, food may be a little more difficult to find. And you know, in terms of some of the other categories, uh, we're not seeing anything real unusual there. The, the livestock conflicts you know, have been greater in the last number of years. Moving on to occupancy of bear management units uh, by females with offspring. Um, so this is counting not just females with cubs, um, but it is including females with uh, yearlings or two-year-olds on their side. And we had 17 of 18 bear management units occupied by females with offspring during 2015, and uh, 18 out of uh, all 18 units uh, were occupied at least four out of, out of six years, we keep a basically a six year running tally of occupancy. As I mentioned earlier, our data on the known fate analysis uh, are probably one of our, our strongest data sets. We get a lot of um, valuable information um, because we actually get to handle these individuals get to look at their body condition, get age information, get genotypes, etc., and we are able to monitor them uh, through GPS and VHF telemetry. We had a total number of captures of, of uh, 104. Um, a lot of these were management captures. This was a, a year with you know, relatively higher number of conflicts, including actually quite a few outside the demographic monitoring area. So. The, the research captures are these uh, white circles, the, the management captures are these, uh, these red squares. We had a total number of individuals of 87. Um, male bias in this sample, uh, we, we uh, have relatively no, low number of, of females in this sample. And we had uh, 62 out of those 87 um, were new individuals, never been captured before. And this is what, what intrigues me a lot. Um, if you look at, at these numbers, first of all, um, if you look at, at the number of, of individuals, you know, we keep catching a fair number of, of total individuals. Um, what is really interesting, if you look at the percentage of those that are, that are new captures, uh, that percentage has been pretty constant. And 72% this year, uh, the average for this graph is about 62%. So 62% year in, year out are new individuals, never been known to science. Um, that is amazing and that cannot happen if this population were anywhere doing anything like a decline. That is simply not possible. So we get a lot of new individuals. It tells us that recruitment keeps continuing, that it, it's, it's, it's not a, a an, a separate analysis of, of population status. It is additional information that confirms and supports everything else we've been reporting. We're monitoring a lot of individuals. Um, we have throughout this year we've we've monitored 107 individuals. Uh, adult females are a specific target for known fate monitoring. And so we have a, we, we try to maintain at least 25. We'll be doing well on that uh, this year. Currently we have uh, 68 individuals uh, radio marked. Um, still doing reasonably well on our sample of females. And you know, we, we lose uh, radio colors because they're shed over time or they, they drop off. We have a, a drop off mechanism on all, on all colors. And there's a couple of areas that are, that are still missing right now. We take uh, bioimpedance measurements to get a, a sense of a percent body fat of these individuals, and um, on an annual basis, we don't we don't necessarily get a lot of data. Um, but so we're looking at females versus males here, 
uh, across the active season. So the blue dots and, and these uh, vertical lines are the 95% confidence intervals. These blue dots represent the period of 2000 to 2014. And as you see, what is typically, what is very typical of the pattern is they, um, they will actually lose body fat in the early spring season, then start gaining and you know, kind of peak out towards the end of hyperphagia before they start denning. And you know, the, the few records we have for females this year don't see, show anything really out of line. What is really interesting is the males actually. Uh, the males kind of show the same pattern um, based on the average from 2000 to 2014, looking at the blue dots here. Compare those to the green dots. Um, what we see is that in the beginning of the season, nothing unusual, and then we see that their body condition in terms of percent body fat was actually somewhat what low uh, through July and August. And so that is indicative of these animals maybe having some trouble finding the food resources that they normally find. But what is really interesting and amazing is by the time that we reach this point in September, October, they're back up pretty close to where the average is. So somehow in this time period, since this the initial low uh, body fat percentage, um, they've, they've been able to regain a lot of that which I think is a testament uh, to their incredible resilience. You know, these are incredibly resourceful, opportunistic animals, and I think this is prime evidence of that. Not much news on, in terms of genetic monitoring, um, other than the presentation that I will give you next. Um, you're going to have to listen to me a little bit longer. Um, we have not gotten our samples back from 2014. We got a little bit late into the queue for the analysis, and so not much to report there other than that up to this point we still have no evidence of uh, ancestry from outside the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem uh, in, uh, in our genetic samples. Then I'm going to wrap up uh, with food monitoring. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the partner agencies, uh, we, we do a lot of uh, food monitoring, spend a lot of effort on that. Um, kind of focusing on, on high calorie food sources. So the first one, uh, this is uh, data that, that are compiled by Kerry Gunter and his folks um, for Yellowstone National Park, basically looking at um, uh, winter kill, uh, spring carcasses. And if you look, uh, you know, you can kind of look at some of these numbers, they're, they're pretty low. They're this uh, number of carcass, mean number of carcasses per kilometer of transects of 0.09 is relatively low compared to earlier years. So there was a, a low supply of, of winter killed ungulates in the spring. Cutthroat trout um, historically were a valuable calorie rich food source for those bears that are that reside uh, near Yellowstone Lake. And of course, we all know about uh, the effects of lake trout on that population. Cutthroat trout have declined um, substantially, and so the Park Service has uh, put in a substantial effort to remove lake trout. And uh, especially in, in recent years, the gill netting efforts have really been been stepped up. And if you look at the in the last four or five years, that the number of lake trout that have been removed from Yellowstone Lake. Uh, these are astonishing numbers. So for 2015, uh, PJY told me it was uh, 315,000 lake trout removed. What is really interesting and I think very insightful is that this effort seems to be working. If you look at the catch per unit effort uh, in the last four or five years, it has really declined. And that's, that's really telling you it's becoming more and more difficult to get that, to remove that number of lake trout from the lake. And that means that, that you're making a dent in this population. So um, with that, there, there are some positive signs here that these efforts are paying off. And I think it especially occurred after, uh, after some of this was contracted out to commercial fishing. And we see a response um, in terms of, uh, both in terms of uh, cutthroat trout returning to these streams. Uh, we see a little bit of an uptick in that number, and we also see a little more grizzly bear activity around these areas. Uh, I'm not saying that everything is solved here, uh, by no means, but, but there are some positive trends here. And I think uh, Kerry Gunther said there were um, observations of bears feeding on, um, foraging on, on cutthroat trout in four different streams now. So these are promising signs. 
the army cutworm moth sites, the aggregation sites, um, you know, we typically refer to those as insect aggregation sites because there may be other insects that bears are feeding on, ladybird beetles, for example, uh, but we know it's primarily army cutworm moths. Uh, there's 31 confirmed sites now. Um, you see those in the, in the blue dots here. Uh, and when I say confirmed sites, that means that there's uh, multiple observations of bears feeding during more than one year. And then we have 15 possible sites where we have at least a, you know, we have a single observation of one or two or more bears uh, feeding. And so the number of sites that we've documented since, since this really was first documented in the ecosystem in 1986, there were just a couple of sites and that number has, has increased initially very rapidly as, we, as the study team started discovering new sites. And we're pretty much leveled out here. There's, there's no indication that we're going to discover a lot more uh, additional sites where, where grizzly bears might be feeding on army cookware moths. Um, what is interesting in, in terms of the percentage of those sites that's used, it's been relatively constant over time with quite a bit of variation because of snow conditions. Um, this is a good example in 1993. It was a heavy snow cover late into the season. Um, bears just <clears throat> didn't have the opportunity to actually forage there. We've seen for the last couple of years, as you might recall, I've been reporting increased use of these sites by grizzly bears, both in terms of the, uh, the, the number of groups and the number of bears. And this is a year where we actually see that uh, a little bit lower than, than the last couple of years. We, we kept wondering how much more can these sites be, be used. Uh, and and this, is, uh, this year is an answer to that. Um, there there seems to be less use of these sites uh, this year. Uh, there were a lot of bears lo you know, seen and located near the moth sites uh, in alpine areas, and they were feeding on, on other uh, food sources, uh, digging for gophers and stuff like that. The Wyoming Game and Fish Department has done um, census surveys of the moth sites in terms of the number of animals that are using these sites for the last uh, number of years, since 2012. And the numbers that, that are observed at these sites are, are pretty remarkable. Um, you know, going from, from about 100 to a, a peak of 220 in, uh, in 2014, and this year we had 179. And these numbers of females with cubs of the year um, kind of correspond to that. Uh, relatively, you know, relatively high number of females with cubs of the year on these sites still. What's also interesting is um, if you look at, at, at these numbers, the total population observed is about 10 times as many as the, the, the number of females with cubs observed at these sites. That's very similar to what we see with the Chow 2 estimator, which is derived independently of this. So again, it builds conf confidence into our analysis. Large number of animals use those sites. Whitebuck pine transaction.